David is a big deal. I don't know how many sermons are taught on each individual person in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but I bet there's a whole lot about David. We really like those books that inspire us. We really like the stories, this guy who starts out essentially like a farm boy, a young shepherd who then becomes a king. And at one point along the way, not only is he a a general and a mighty warrior, he's a bit of a rock star playing for the king that came before him. And so this is a big, important man in the Old Testament. He was a precursor, a pre-type of Christ, and that he kind of gave us a little shadow of what Jesus would be like. And of course, he would be in the lineage of Jesus himself. Now, Samuel, the prophet, would meet David when he was sent after Saul, the then king of Israel, had disobeyed God. Now, Saul had been picked more for looks, right? They, the people wanted a king, and they wanted to be like every other nation. So God said, fine, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you a king like every other nation. Now, Saul didn't start off all the way bad, but he began to disobey God. And once he had, God was on the move to seek out a man who was after his own heart, not just Saul, who looked the part. And so Samuel, the prophet at the time, he was sent out and he was sent to a little town called Bethlehem and he was sent to the house of a guy named Jesse and that is where he is going to meet and then anoint David for his special role. And that's where we want to start with. So let's go ahead and look at 1 Samuel 16.6. And we'll try after you get to that 16 mark, we're going to be skipping through some verses in the following chapters. But 1 Samuel 16.6. When they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So Jesse's starting to bring his boys and going, all right, you're saying one of my boys is going to get blessed here? Well, here, let's start. And he starts going down the ladder. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height or his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, Saul had been good looking. He looked the part, but he didn't have the internal character for the part. Too many of us focus on the outside, both in ourselves and in how we look at other people. Some of us constantly fight that battle of the bulbs, they call it, where, you know, we're thinking about weight. And hey, gluttony doesn't get called out enough. It is listed as a sin, and it is something that we should think about for our health. But there is this weird social pressure of trying to look a certain way or do something on the outside so that people will give you the appropriate amount of attention. And this is a meme that I love very much to kind of demonstrate that that goes beyond more than we realize. This is Barbie. Throughout the years, she has been the center of, the, of much controversy because feminists claim she represents an unrealistic, unhealthy, and unfair standard of beauty, leading to a crisis for young girls and their self-esteem. This is He-Man. Now, I hope you get the point, (laughs) right? There is on one side, hey, nobody can look like that. And then also, hey, this is just He-Man. Well, guys can't look like that either, all right? At some point, you're going to encounter individuals that are more skilled than you, more attractive than you, more knowledgeable than you. You're going to encounter that. But both men and women in our culture feel this pressure to change the outside, to receive love, to receive attention and acceptance. And it can be very damaging in a culture where there is airbrushed and photoshopped people everywhere, where there is this stained glass masquerade, even in church sometimes, where we pretend to be perfect. And you're looking at all these seemingly perfect people and knowing that you are not, it can be quite depressing and defeating. Many single folks, they're just trying to get the outside right so that they can attract that individual on the, on the, uh, you know, to them. And then other folks, they're kind of paranoid, like, wow, what if, what if somebody better comes along? You know, all these things are going through. And then there's aging folks that go, huh, I made a comment today. Somebody said, you know, you kind of look like a grandpa to Isabella. And I was like, oh, man, I am getting a lot of white in my beard, aren't I? You know, things, things are fake. This hairline's going back. I would rather it turn gray or turn white and turn loose, but I don't get to pick that. You know, and I, I talked to someone just the other day in a nursing home. They were a little, little disappointed in their ability to walk now. So some of us have to deal with that, man, the, the outside, maybe it's past the prime or it's a little different than I want it to be. Well, we have to deal with all this, but I think it's important. This should convict you, but first I want it to comfort you. It's very important for you to take away that God looks at your inside and loves you regardless of what's on the outside. Man, isn't that a relief? You don't have to do a whole bunch of fashionable things. You don't have to be in the best shape. You don't have to have everything figured out. But God loves you. Now, 
I do have, of course, some other people in my life that I think love me like that. But not everybody is like that. A lot of people do look on the outside. But that isn't just a comfort. I want you to think about that again. God knows who you are on the inside and still loves you. God knows those thoughts that you can't hide from him. Now, he's not some spy, you know, just psychically waiting for that bad thought to come and then, you know, to go after you at it. But he knows who you are inside in a way probably that you don't even realize you yourself are. And yet he still loves you. And he loves you enough that he wants to transform you from the inside out. And so we shouldn't uh, fool ourselves into thinking we can get away with not fixing the inside. Jesus talked about the Pharisees being whitewashed tombs. You know, they look nice on the outside, but there were dead men's bones on the inside. Our culture often focuses on the outside, but Jesus wants to transform us within. We should admit that we need that and then allow him to do so. Now, for little David, on the outside, turns out he wasn't ugly, but he was just still kind of the runt of the litter. And compared to all these other boys that had come before him, his father, Jesse, didn't even think David was a possible option. All right, we've got, okay, he's going to meet one of my boys. Something important is going to happen. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, it ain't you. You go out and you hang out with the sheep outside. It's one of you, so you all gather in here and we'll leave all that work out there to David. A man being the littlest little brother might have been tough for David at that moment. But let's read. Verse 11, still in chapter 16. And Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. It's not very clear, by the way, that David knew exactly what he was being anointed for. If you remember, Samuel, he was a a special case where Hannah had prayed for this boy and then said, you know, if you open up my womb, I'll give the baby back to you. She had done that. He was raised among priests, but he became a great prophet. And his time was maybe coming to an end. He had a seminary, essentially, in Ramah. Uh, One of the first times we see something like that where he's training prophets kind of separately from the priest uh, situation there, the Levitical priesthood, and he's training people to go out and speak and represent God and to learn deeply. And his kids, they were having the same kind of problems that the high priest had had when he was a kid. They were not really following their father. And so this might have looked like an anointing for a new prophet. So David really didn't know just yet. It's not very clear, but yes, of course, While his mission or the details of it may not have been clear, he knew something was on the horizon. And he knew God had picked him for something. And we're going to see that that involves a lot of amazing moments. Now, we all know the famous story of David and Goliath, right? He's going at this point, he's actually still just the shepherd boy. And he's actually going to give provisions to his three oldest brothers who are fighting. He wasn't on the battlefield. Right? He was just the farm boy still. But he shows up and he hears this challenge from David, uh, from Goliath. And David hears it and, and thinks, why isn't anyone uh, responding to this challenge? Goliath is saying, why are we just fighting in these big armies? He was with the Philistines and he had other normal sized people with him. Uh, but he was sticking out among them. And there was all these Israeli, Israelite soldiers here. And he's saying, why are we fighting in big armies with lots of people? Now, how about you just send one person after me? Now, of course, when you're eight, nine, ten foot tall, and you say, hey, I'll, we'll just tackle this one-on-one. That does not seem very fair. This whole fight reframed the way that we look at fights. But here's what we read when he starts hearing the challenges coming from Goliath. Now, we're in 17 now, 1726. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? And this is the part I really want you to read. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? David took his insults at the people of God and his challenge to the people of God as being directed at God himself. And he said, "Uh uh-uh, that's my God, this is God's people, you are not going to do this kind of stuff. And he gets upset. And he is going to try on the king's armor, that isn't going to work, 
right? He's like, no, that's not going to it. And so he took a slingshot to a sword fight. And of course, we remember that he put extra stones in his pocket. And he goes out there and he pulls that swing. And you know the story. He lets one loose and it lands right in the center of his head. Now, this depicts him with a spear. I love this artist. It's an Indonesian artist. But he did have a sword, Goliath did, on his on his side, because we know after that one single shot, he fell. And then David, and you can be thankful. Some of you will be thankful. Some of you may be disappointed. I did not get a slide for this one. Uh, David took out that giant sword and cut his own head off. And it was an amazing defeat. Now, David had been promised, you know, the, the, to be wedded to Saul's daughter, the king's daughter, and riches and all these kinds of things. And he begins to move in and become really popular. He spends time with the king. He does get married. We see all these connections here. And I think a lot of people look at this story and they, they often just kind of end David's story here. You can hear these amazing, amazing inspirational stories about, yeah, with God, you can be a giant slayer. Well, yeah, there are times in your life where there could be a giant. But if you read this in context, remember the reason he knew he could fight the giant was just as a shepherd in his daily life, God had provided him the strength to take out a bear and a lion as he protected his flock. This was an ongoing, growing, and increasing faith that he had, and it was a trust in God. It's not just that David is the superhero. It's that he was empowered and called by God to do these things, and God had increasingly shown him and developed a relationship with him. Now, he would go on to be a general. He would go on to tackle a lot of things. Uh, He would go on to write psalms. He would go on, unfortunately, to deal with the rebellion of his own son. And, of course, we know the story of Bathsheba. By the way, Bathsheba would have known that David could have seen her, but David wasn't even supposed to be there. At that time, he was supposed to be out at war, and David shouldn't have been looking in the first place. There was all kinds of sin going on there, and he used his power to get that woman pregnant and her husband killed. And yet, after all this, God still used him. So he had some serious issues. But we read read this about David in Acts 13, 22. After he had removed him, that is Saul, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, or my own heart, you might be more familiar with that phrase, who will do all my will. Now, was David perfect? No. But even when he didn't pursue God in those moments of time, he then resubmitted. Oh, and read those Psalms and that turn of, of honesty and that relationship and that struggle. And David would turn and trust in God. And that's why he was righteous. That's why he was holy, because he got his righteousness from trusting in God the Father and understanding that God was in charge. Even though he became a powerful king, he knew that ultimately he answered to somebody. And even when he was imperfect, he would try to resubmit and be allegiant to his king. Now, those of us that grew up with uh, the uh, King James, we might be familiar with this phrase a little bit differently. Uh, but there is, you know, we are more than conquerors through Jesus. And so Romans 8.37 says this, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. But I think sometimes when we look at David, we get confused about the whole picture of the story. In your life, in the story, there are moments, yes, where God has trained you and prepared you and you have this opportunity to respond and you can step up and trust and something really amazing can happen and God can move. But you know who you are most of the time in the story if we just compare these individuals with the way reality works? If we look at the story of salvation, do you know who you are? You're not David. Jesus is David. Jesus is the one who showed up and did the winning. You know who you are? Most of the time, you're the damsel in distress or the soldiers shaking in their boots. Now, God's transforming you past that. But sometimes, sadly, we've even been the giant. We've even been the enemy. We've been the one sinning and hurting God's people, hurting each other. But there is somebody else. There's somebody who we're supposed to be if we look at the story of the reality, kind of the way we should behave and interact with other people. There's somebody else in the story that we should really try to emulate and learn from. And so I would encourage you today, rather than listen to all the sermons who try to tell you to be a David, you can't always be a David. I would encourage you to be a Jonathan. Now, you might not know who Jonathan is. That's one of the reasons we try to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse here a lot. 
Because sometimes if we don't do that, we skip over important people and important passages. Of course, now we're in Luke, and so those are very commonly gone over passages. So this is an opportunity to pause and look at somebody I think sometimes gets neglected. But I have to say, I actually admire Jonathan more than I admire David, because it's easy to kind of march on when you feel like you're God's anointed hero and everything's going your way and you've got some mighty men of renown around you. That's kind of easy. But it's a little harder to give up your rights to recognize that God's moving elsewhere or doing something else and just support that. So King Saul had this son named Jonathan. And by the time David came on the scene, Jonathan already had received accolades. He was already a successful warrior. Now, King Saul became jealous of David's success, but Jonathan didn't. So let's move up. We're in 1 Samuel 18. Let's look at verse 28. When Saul saw and knew, that's hard to say, when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him, then Saul was even more afraid of David. Thus Saul was David's enemy continually. Saul didn't see, all right, I've got this brother. I've got this wonderful anointed person of God here. We can work together to do God's will. What Saul saw was, this man is a threat to my power. He's getting the attention I deserve and I want. I don't want that to happen. But let's look at Jonathan's response. Now Saul told Jonathan, his son, and all his servants to put David to death. But Jonathan's Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. There are different responses that you can have to this. I want you to know, you choose to either be jealous of someone's success or supportive or inspired. Remember this meme here? You could be jealous that you could never look like that or you could make some improvements. But let's go beyond the physical. You could go and see somebody else who's doing something a little better than you and you could try to tear them down or you could try to join them and support them or try to learn from them. If they're doing something successful, maybe you could learn from them. This applies really in our workplaces, where if we are not competing with each other unnaturally, but are learning from one another, man, we could go further together. So jealousy is a choice. Don't choose it. Instead, partner with and learn from the people that God is clearly using. Now, Jonathan didn't complain uh, that David got put in second in command already or anything like that. He was glad he had a brother in arms. He saw someone that was skilled who was on their side and he was thankful to have him. And so they bonded together. But unfortunately, Saul continued to be jealous to the point that eventually David is going to have to flee. So let's jump ahead a little bit again. Let's read 1 Samuel 20, verse 13. If it, pleases, if it please my father to do you harm, this is Jonathan talking, May the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, if I do not make it known to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? You shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. Vows like this were a part of the culture. And now I'm a Kentucky hillbilly, if you don't know that. And I can remember even as a kid knowing about people having like the blood brother pack where they'd cut their knuckles and do this kind of thing. And please don't ever do that. Okay. There's no, we share enough germs already. Uh, But that was a thing. This was a manly bonding thing. This was not something inappropriate. And unfortunately, some individuals today will look back on these two making a vow, and they will try to import our culture's obsession with marital relations, I'll call it, because we've got young people in the room, and they will try to import that and put this over Jonathan and David. Okay, Jonathan and David weren't a couple. Okay, they were best friends. They were brothers in arms. And this was literally, you know, David's brother-in-law. And so they're looking at each other like family, and they see that they're on the same side and they're trying to pursue God. And so they are really, yes, loving one another, but doing so appropriately. I have on my wedding ring, 1 Corinthians 13. If you don't memorize a whole lot of chapters in the Bible, I do hope you remember 1 Corinthians 13. You should instantly think about what love is and the definition of love. But where do we hear that passage always read? Weddings. But do you know who that passage was written to? The church. That kind of love is what we're supposed to have for one another in this community. 
And that's how we can come together. You know, we call this room in particular a sanctuary. We can come together and experience real love and support for one another. And then with that wonderful thing that can be so different from the world, then we can go back out there and serve God, refreshed, recharged, knowing other people have our backs. And it is a wonderful thing. Well, keep that in mind. 1 Corinthians 13 isn't about marriage. It's about the church. So read it and live it. That could be a whole other message, and certainly we'll, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 13 again sometime soon. But please, love the people around you. I think our culture is dip, deeply twisted. They understood that, again, we'll call it marital relations. That happens to somebody who normally there was an arranged marriage to. But they could love many people. And I think in our culture today, we're obsessed with the physical, and we want to do that with a whole lot of people. But we don't actually want to love many people or love very few or none at all. Now, David and Jonathan's time, they understood covenant was really important. And then they're moving forward based off of this covenant. And David is going to have to flee. But a little bit later, we get to see amongst all of this drama that unfolded where now we see David kind of leading a band of rebels and his government kind of going down and trying to wipe them out. They just want to live. Saul wanted him dead. There was even opportunities for David to kill Saul, and David wouldn't take it. So he's fleed, and it's important to know, and it's important to be encouraged, and I didn't make this little application slide, that the truth will come out. Be patient. Don't try to speed things up. But here, we eventually see that Jonathan is going to come to David again. 1 Samuel 23 now, verse 15. Now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life. When David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh, and Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horesh and encouraged him in God. Thus he said to him, Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul my father will not find you. And you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul my father knows that also. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed at Horesh while Jonathan went to his house. Let's think about that. Who was Jonathan's dad again? Saul. What was Saul? The king, right? Now, how did, how did people normally pick who's the next king? It's their son. And we know this, even David did this. There's dynasties there, right? But who did Jonathan say would be the next king? David. Jonathan could have said, it's my right, or it's my dad whom I love who has an issue with you. I will side with my family that I love instead of siding with what's right. Or I will demand my rights or my roles or what I think was given to me. At one point before David came on the scene, it looked like, hey, you know, all right, my dad got picked to be king. I'm, I'm a big warrior now. Oh, one day I'll be king. But Jonathan, rather than focus on his rights or determine what roles he wanted to serve, he recognized, hey, this is what God is doing. I've got your back. I'm on your side. Whatever side God wants, that's the side that I'm on. So that's why I admire Jonathan even more than David, because it's easy to be the hero when everything, you know, looks like they're supporting you, but it's harder to give up your rights and uplift the people around you. So that's why I encourage people to be a Jonathan. In fact, everyone needs some kind of Jonathan. Everyone needs some kind of Barnabas, for those of us that know the New Testament, and how much, you know, we might think about Paul all the time, but you look and he has this band of people around him that are important to him. Now, you might say that's easy to say as a pastor or a boss or things like that. I've heard those messages. You know, I, I'm at the pastor's conferences, things like that. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's easy for you to say that you need, you know, you want people to support whatever. Well, I have to let you know that if you remember pieces of my story, um, I never wanted to go to California. I jokingly said that I would only go to California if God called me here. And I literally got a phone call going, hey, this is Rashio Christie. We want to hire you, but you have to go to California right now for this training. I was like, oh, God has a sense of humor. If you remember, if you've heard my testimony of how I came to be in the ministry, I had other plans for my life. Everybody else recognized that I was going to go into the ministry. And literally, God had to give me a vision of when I was praying, Somebody asked me to teach, and I said, I don't know. Well, God, what do I teach? I don't do this kind of thing. And he said, thanks for your ministry. I didn't have an option. I was going to go be a high school teacher, focus on history. And some of my favorite pastors, I, I've talked with them, and uh, one of them recently said, you know, I have this fantasy about being a truck driver. And I was like, oh, I so do too. We can read the word. We can sing praise in our truck. We can drive around. And no responsibility other than getting the load there and getting back. No people, no heartache. It's really wonderful. 
But you know what? We don't get to pick where we serve. And the reality is, is pastors aren't super Christians. And did you realize, and I hope you do, that I have a pastor, that I go to church. I have small studies and Zoom groups. And some of those guys, they go. And so we're ha- we have mutual accountability. People with the title pastor or elder, these people, myself included, aren't super Christians. We aren't elevated above anybody else, and we shouldn't be. We're doing our part, and your part is just as, in some cases, more important, in my view. Uh, and that's why we celebrated our volunteers recently with this volunteer dinner. And those of us with, you know, some kind of title, like pastor, we all waited tables. Keep us humble and keep you guys knowing that this is a bodily effort together, right? Now, sometimes it sounds really exciting to get that center of attention moment to be like David, but I don't think we want the conditions that it requires to need that hero in the first place. This is one of my favorite Tolkien quotes. Frodo is kind of upset that he's having to go through things, and he says, I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so, so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Jonathan had a task. His task was to support David. His task was to follow God. He didn't get a chance to choose what his task was, right? Just like I couldn't, even if I really wanted to, replace Romy or or anyone like that on the worship team. And, And thankfully I don't, and you certainly wouldn't want me to, right? We each have an opportunity to serve. I'm very thankful to serve here, even though I did say, you know, I never wanted to go to California. I'm very thankful that I followed God here. And this is true in your workplace too. You may not get to pick the role that you have, but whatever role you do have, please honor God with it. I've already reminded you that God looks at the inside and loves you regardless of what's on the outside. That God knows who you are on the inside and still loves you, and that should convict us to let him change us that we can't hide anything inside. 1 Corinthians 13 isn't about marriage. It's about the church, that we should read it and live it. And it's up to you. You choose to be either jealous of someone's success or supportive or inspired. And that we should partner and learn from the people that God is clearly using. But you know what? If we all try to be the big hero, the big shot, if we all try to be David, you know what happens? Nobody gets to be David. We all pull in a hundred different directions. There are moments that we are David, and that we get to challenge, take a really big challenge and we have to be obedient. But hopefully someone's there to be a Jonathan. But you know what does happen if everyone tries to be a Jonathan for each person as they go through the stage of life? Well, then we're supporting one another. Then we have each other's backs. Then we're not focused on me or me being the star of the story. Instead, we recognize that Jesus is the star of the story and that together we're all supporting him. And whether it be Paul needing a Barnabas or, you know, Moses needing a Joshua, moves of God typically require encouragers. So the takeaway is, moves of God use one or more encouragers. If you want to see a move of God, you know, we've, some of us have talked about Asbury. Some of us have talked about, you know, various things like, oh, I can, you know, remember seeing somebody get saved. If you want to see those kinds of things, be a Jonathan. If you want to see somebody do really well at what they're called to do, don't just tear them down or hurt them or critique them or be jealous of them. Find what other people are good at and lift them up in that. And if we're all doing that together, then we're all going to get lifted up. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Jonathan. We ask that you would help us to be sources of encouragement to the people who are doing ministry around us, who are serving you around us, whether it be the folks that we know that are Gideons, the folks that we know that are wonderful singers, the folks that we know that are working on tech, the folks who are just amazing greeters, whatever it is, help us to see how you are working through other people. Affirm that in their lives and then empower them, encourage them to continue in that. And help us all just to be a part of a community that has one another's backs so that we can move forward and be used by you to just engage the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.